In the Caribbean, an underwater mountain is a spawning area for endangered fish. Research shows why it's a very special place and needs protection. I think a lot of people don't understand how critical it is if we start losing species in the marine environment. In the melting Arctic, more shipping traffic and oil exploration means increasing hazards for wildlife and the people who live there. Without good international regulation, it, it's gonna be like the Wild West. And on an untamed river in southern Georgia, is this reckless industrial pollution? There is no way to look at this wastewater and question whether it violates water quality standards. Those stories and more, now on This American Land. Funding for This American Land provided by the Weiss Foundation, the Pew Charitable Trust, and the Turner Foundation. Hello and welcome to This American Land. I'm Bruce Burkhart. And I'm Caroline Ravel with some special stories for you today about conserving America's natural resources, our landscapes, waters, and wildlife, and about people who are dedicated to protecting those resources. We start in the Caribbean off the western coast of Puerto Rico where researchers are using special technology to document the spawning of endangered fish. Spawning aggregation sites are critically important for the survival of many species in the oceans. And there's one in Puerto Rican waters that has been severely impacted by overfishing. Scientists say an effectively enforced marine protected area is urgently needed there. My name is Michelle Scherer. I'm a marine biologist. So hopefully we'll get a chance to also um, find some black grouper. Dr. Michael Nemeth and I are doing research on grouper species in western Puerto Rico, including Bajo de Sico. Bajo de Sico is actually a really great site because we have multiple grouper species spawning there. This is an offshore seamount, which is actually an underwater mountain, and it serves as an attractant to a lot of species around it. Bajo de Sico is the only place in the U.S. Caribbean, Puerto Rico shelf, where Nassau groupers still aggregate to spawn. Most of the grouper species, including the Nassau grouper, have really declined their population numbers because when they aggregate to spawn, they're really easy to catch. They've been overfished in some places, and their populations are so depressed that they are candidates for the endangered species list. We are trying to identify how many grouper are coming into the aggregation site, and we also want to know what their behavior is when they are going to spawn. The sounds that these grouper make are very distinctive, and that gives us a tool to be able to identify which species are present at the spawning site. Down there we have hydrophones, which are underwater microphones, which are really sensitive to the low frequency sounds that they make. But in order to make sure we hear them when they're not making these sounds, we have a secondary complement in which we're using acoustic tags, which we insert inside the belly of the fish. And once these fish have this chip inside them or this acoustic transmitter, they can be picked up at our different receivers we have throughout the bank. We're able to record information over a long period of time without actually being in the water. Even though we can't hear them when they're making their courtship sounds, we can still detect them with this technology in different parts of the bank as they move towards and away from their spawning site. My name is Henio Pinero. I'm the vice chair for, for the Caribbean Fishery Management Council. Balsico is a very important area for us. It's a nursing ground for many species. It's the habitat of many other species. We have to protect the corals also. The most difficult part is ignorance. Sometimes you get uh, young people, recreational people, 
tourists who don't know what they're doing and they go, they spear fish, and when they come back, they say, look what I got, what is this? And, uh, and it really bothers us down here because we are uh, engaged in a real battle to protect that species. We've heard a lot of stories of how Nassau grouper used to be the most common fish on every reef here in Puerto Rico. It's been commercially extinct since the 80s. People can't make a living off Nassau grouper anymore, not only because it's regulated, but there just aren't enough. So now they're moving on to smaller species of grouper and other species of snapper, and even parrotfish, which is really sad because once we eliminate the top parts of the food web, then we're going into the medium parts, and eventually all we'll have left is lionfish. And that's one of the special things about these multi-species spawning aggregations. Some of them we found have been fished almost entirely out, and when you protect them, they'll come back. If you are able to take the fishing pressure off of these spawning fish at those critical times of the year, they will recover. What's been the downfall for some of these fish that they only get together one time during the year and only in this spot, and so, you know, boats can go and come back to the same place every year just like the fish, that can also be their salvation because we know where to go, we can target our protections at those areas, and then we can watch those species recover. The Bajo de Seco area in particular is protected during six months of the year. That is from October to March, there is no fishing on the reef. However, this closed fishing season needs to incorporate the spawning months of all the species that aggregate there to spawn. Recent studies have actually shown that the spawning season is extending, so perhaps it would be wise to shift those six months closure to make sure we include all the different species that spawn. It's like the lost city down there. The structure is there, the habitat's incredible, the coral is incredible. There are not that many fish, but they were there. Ask any fisherman, they'll tell you how abundant these fish were there. Turn the radio on. I got my line, okay? My name is Edwin Fon. Everybody call me Pauco, the fisherman. And for 50 years, I take grouper, any kind of grouper, yo. He buceado alrededor de la isla. Y este es el sitio que jamás se me olvidara por la belleza. Era como si tú estuvieses buceando en una pecera gigante. You hear from the fishermen that they would like to get back to the old days when fish were much more abundant. Many of the fishermen know what needs to be done, but there's a lot of thought about if I don't take the fish, somebody else is going to take it. We need to go beyond that with the fishermen so that we can all get back to healthier fisheries like they were in the past. Nassau grouper, uh, it was really hit very hard. And in order for them to uh, come back, bounce back, they need aggregations up to a thousand individuals. So you need a large enough area that they can thrive and they cannot be uh, fished. If we could really get the no-take regulations enforced, uh, there are various other species that could benefit beside the Nassau grouper. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because it's such an important landmark, Bajo de Sico is attracting all kinds of wildlife, oh. including the humpback whales. But because they come down here to breed and to mate, they really need protected sites. And what's now um, increasingly uh, important is ecosystem-based fishery management. And this takes a holistic look at the entire ecosystem. So for example, instead of just setting catch limits on the red hind or the black grouper, you're looking at the ecosystem role that these fish play. So it's important to protect fish like the Nassau grouper, which are at the top of that food web of the marine ecosystem, but it's also important to protect the little guys, the forage fish, or the, the foundation of that food web. I think a lot of people don't really understand how critical it is if we start losing species in the marine environment. There's some really hopeful stories from other places in the Caribbean. For example, Belize has 11 Nassau grouper spawning sites protected. Uh, Cayman has one of the largest spawning aggregations of Nassau grouper, where approximately 3,000 grouper just come together to spawn every year in one place. It's a story of hope for Bajo de Sico that we could eventually have that change towards a more positive trend in the populations of Nassau grouper.
Now we go to a totally different marine area, far to the north in the Arctic. Because of climate change, there's a rapid loss of summer sea ice in the Arctic Ocean, and that's opening the region to ship traffic, oil exploration, and other industrial activities that were never possible before. The gateway to the Arctic is the Bering Strait, only about 50 miles across at its narrowest point. It's a migration corridor for whales, seals, walruses, and seabirds. And all this increased shipping traffic and oil exploration in that harsh climate will create growing risk to that wildlife and to the local people who hunt and fish in the region. Conservationists say new measures are needed to protect the marine environment there, and we sent our crew to Alaska to learn more. The Arctic is a tough place to operate in. Warming sea temperatures are causing the loss of ice cover in the Arctic in the summer months, and that's opened the Arctic up to increase shipping activity, increased other economic activity, like energy exploration. I'm Roger Roof, I'm retired Coast Guard Vice Admiral. So yeah, I think shipping is gonna to continue to increase dramatically over the next several years. And it's probably not at a critical point yet, but it's close to that. A Kulik was a shell oil rig that was being towed for maintenance. And it encountered some heavy weather, not untypical for that time of year, and the, the tow line parted. The vessel went aground, and the 18 people aboard had to be rescued by Coast Guard helicopter. The Kulik incident revealed that if you're gonna pursue economic activity uh, in the Arctic, you have to be prepared for it. And you can't just assume that if you have experience in the Gulf of Mexico, that that transfers automatically to the Arctic. It's a challenging environment because of severe weather that we encounter routinely in that part of the world. It is also a very diverse and resilient and fragile ecosystem. The Bering Strait has species that we don't find anywhere else in the United States. My name is Marilyn Hyman. I'm the U.S. Arctic Program Director for the Pew Charitable Trusts. The Yupik and Inupiat people have lived there for time immemorial, living off of the ocean, really without much interference. And now with shipping, we're having much more impact to that, that ecosystem and those people and their way of life. Oil spills can happen. Uh, you can have strikes of marine mammals. You can have interference with hunters who are in small boats that those large vessels don't even know are there. So there are lots of concerns about increased shipping. And what we would like to see is a much more sustainable approach that um, will not impact this ecosystem. Bering Strait is a, a pinch between the Pacific and the whole Arctic. My name is Kate Stafford, and I'm an oceanographer at the University of Washington. So it's this very narrow bottleneck through which a mass migration of animals passes twice a year. Sound is actually the most important sense for marine mammals. They really rely on sound to navigate, to find food, as a reproductive display and, and to keep together. What I do is I put an instrument called a hydrophone underwater and we leave it there for about a year. And that hydrophone or underwater microphone records all the sounds in the ocean. It records seals, it records whales, it records ship passages. It records oil and gas seismics. When you increase noise in the ocean, whether that's from something like a storm and wind or whether that's from a ship passage, it reduces the space over which animals can detect sounds, detect each other, and over which they can communicate. And that has the potential to, to really impact how they migrate and how they find food. We just need to figure out how to mitigate it as best we can because everybody's coming up to stake their claim in the Arctic. And without good international regulation and cooperation, it, it's going to be like the Wild West. How we survive here is really the tug and barge industry. I'm Ed Page. I'm the executive director for the Marine Exchange of Alaska, which is located in Juneau. We have tugs and barges come up here and delivering our groceries, our fuel. These are very rich fishery grounds. 
If you're in Alaska, they say, get a beater car, but a good boat. The job of the Marine Exchange is, is exchange maritime information to help make good decisions. This is the Marine Exchange's 24-hour operations center. These dots represent the 100 receiving sites. And what they're receiving is transmissions from vessels. And every couple seconds, they're sending out data on the name, the vessel course, speed, type of cargo. Okay, and this is what I refer to as the Maritime I-5. Beforehand, when vessels cast off, they kind of disappeared over the horizon, didn't see them until they showed up another port. And this is a Bering Strait. Now you see them all the time. And as a result, we can say this vessel is not allowed to go past 15 knots in this particular area because there's whales. And we can ensure they don't. And if they do, alarms go off and emails get sent. It's kind of like having a radar gun every 100 yards along the highway. What we developed was a portable transponder that could be put on a small boat. A large commercial vessel would see them every bit as clearly as a super tanker. Vessels are going to be going through the Arctic because it's an international body of water. So they're going to go through there, determine what the areas of concern are, and then implementing, through technology, measures that can actually ensure the vessels are towing the line. I think most people realize that Alaska really is the last frontier. Uh, what they probably don't realize is that the maritime frontier that's suddenly opening up, it's a sensitive region, and it's an area that we want to protect. There has to be a balance. I'm not opposed to activity in the Arctic. It's coming, but uh, we've got to have appropriate protections in place to ensure that this very rich, diverse, intact ecosystem is preserved. And so what we need to do is define those regions and time of year that are most important to the animals and then make recommendations. Shipping lanes have been moved. Ships have been asked to slow down. Maybe there are some times when you don't allow any shipping. I think the next step is starting to get some very specific traffic lanes that will keep the vessels out of important ecological areas. The Coast Guard and the federal government need to really listen to the communities about what they need and what they want. And they need to be a part of the dialogue, the people who live there, who hunt, who have you know, lived in this incredible place. Our next story is from southern Georgia on the Altamaha River, a major waterway still undammed, flowing in its natural state more than 100 miles to the Atlantic. But there's a problem on that river, a large pulp mill that has been operating there for decades and which critics say has been discharging pollution into the river. Pollution, they say, the company refuses to clean up and which the state of Georgia has been slow to address. We went to the river to see for ourselves. The Altamaha River is one of the last great rivers in the entire world. It drains over a fourth of the state of Georgia and provides water, fresh water, to the largest estuary system in the United States. I'm Deborah Shepard and I'm the executive director of the Altamaha River Keeper. So the health and water quality of this river is important to thousands and thousands of people and untold numbers of living organisms. You can look on Google Earth and you can see that upstream of the mill there is a light color to the river, downstream of the mill it's a dark color. The river changes in the small town of Jessup. That's where the Rainier pulp mill has operated for 60 years. We routinely hear from people who are paddling or in the river who think they're observing an accident because what they are seeing is a discharge of brown, stinky water. I'm Carla Yetter, Vice President of Environmental Affairs for Rainier. This particular facility was built in 1954, and the products from here over the years have changed, and today you'll find them in everything from food to plastics. You could even find it in the film on the LCD screen on your cell phone. Rainier is a company that takes a lot of care in what it does, both in the quality of the products and in reducing the impact on the environment. But the Riverkeeper, also known as ARC, says this global company has not done nearly enough to clean up 50 million gallons of wastewater, or effluent, that it discharges into the river every day. 
After more than a decade of talking, ARC has filed suit against Rainier under the Federal Clean Water Act and the Georgia Water Quality Control Act. There is no way to look at this wastewater or smell this wastewater and question whether it violates the narrative water quality standards in the state of Georgia. This is the background water in the river. This is the water that they're putting in the river. Absent they're voluntarily agreeing to do it, we have to go into the federal court and everybody has to spend tens of thousands of dollars to prove that this is not this. In my career, I've visited well, a bit over 100 mils of the type of Rainier, which is about roughly a quarter of them in the world. The problem at Rainier at Jessup is I think they put a little bit too much to the shareholders and not quite enough to the pollution control. Neil McCubbin is a consultant for the Riverkeeper. He says the technology to clean up this discharge is widely available in the industry. By changing to a modern activated sludge treatment system for the wastewater, they could reduce the discharges by about 50%. Our own research doesn't draw quite as stark a, a conclusion as they do. However, we've heard them and we think that it's something that we want to look into further. The last five or six years, they've reduced the color and overall polluting features of their wastewater by about 50%, which is a nice improvement, but it still leaves them about somewhere in the worst 10% in the country. It's not as simple as spend more money and you'll be better. As a company, we're always looking for the best technology that has a net improvement in the environment. The government currently has no enforcement actions against Rainier. The plant is operating under a consent order from the State Environmental Protection Division to clean up the discharge. But this agency has been reviewing ARC's request for stronger pollution controls for six years. The Georgia Environmental Protection Division has not been doing its job in regard to the permit for this plant and in regard to the wastewater from this mill. It does not regulate all of the pollutants in the water. Here's a statement we got from the Environmental Protection Agency. EPA negotiated with Georgia EPD and the Riverkeeper to put the plan of study in place. We expect to receive the draft permit from the state soon and will review it to ensure it is consistent with the Clean Water Act and protective of the Altamaha River. ARC is not alone in its concerns. The Georgia Water Coalition, made up of 200 water organizations, builders, and fishing groups, has named this stretch of the Altamaha to its dirty dozen list for the past three years. Yeah, that's Pulp Mill Wastewater. That's in Valdivia and Chile. McCubbin says other mills, like many in the thriving South American market, have much cleaner wastewater discharge and still are profitable. This treated effluent comes from the Selco mill near Valdivia, Chile. The plant has an activated sludge wastewater treatment. And this is treated water from three mills in Brazil that McCubbin visited on behalf of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. This is not difficult. We know how to clean up wastewater. People are doing it all over the world. So a successful, profitable company simply cannot continue to say it can't be done when we know it can. For This American Land, I'm Marsha Walton. Back to that earlier story on retreating ice in the Arctic. In our Science Nation report, Miles O'Brien takes us to Greenland, where researchers are gathering samples of fossilized microscopic algae in lake sediments, a project to learn more about environmental change in the Arctic. It's another summer day on the lake. But this is no pleasure cruise. With support from the National Science Foundation, Lake ecologist Jasmine Soros and her team from the University of Maine are plying the lake waters of southwestern Greenland, gathering samples of diatoms to study how climate change is affecting this Arctic ecosystem. A diatom is a type of algae, and it is different from other types of algae because it has what you could call a glass cell wall. 
and gathering water and mud samples from lakes around the edge of the Russell Glacier. Saros is particularly interested in diatom population dynamics, how different species thrive or falter under changing conditions. There can be early indicators of environmental change. So those silica cell walls basically can be deposited in sediments, and we can look over thousands of years and see which diatoms were there in the past. But Saro stresses the work isn't just about diatoms. She's focused on the broader picture. When we look at changes in diatoms in these lakes, it's not because we're so focused on the fact that, you know, oh no, diatoms are changing, what's going to happen? It's the, the bigger implications of that. Using diatoms as a tool to better understand how environmental change affects lake ecosystems. For Jasmine Saros, it's well worth the long, cold days on the water. Now here's a quick look at a story from our next show. These fish have traveled thousands of miles. They have avoided every possible danger. And now to have one dam stand in their way, people are not going to allow that to happen. Thanks for watching. And remember, you can catch us anytime at thisamericanland.org. We'd like to hear your comments and any ideas you have about stories you think we should cover. We'll see you next time. For more information about this program, visit thisamericanland.org. Funding for This American Land provided by the Weiss Foundation, the Pew Charitable Trusts, and the Turner Foundation.